Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be discussing the signs of a chemical reaction. So things that you and I can look for that can tell us that chemical change is going on. As ever we're going to start with an overview. So we're going to first, uh, we're going to begin by revising or reviewing what we mean by chemical change. Um, so that then when we start to think about what to look for, that we have a sense of, of what's going on at the particle level. So then we're going to have a look at the, the series of signs of a chemical reaction that we might look for. So looking at a colour change, the formation of um, bubbles of gas, a precipitate or an insoluble solid that forms, looking at temperature changes, um, the energy release of things like light or sound energy, and also the appearance of a new substance or the disappearance of an existing substance. So we're going to go through each one of these in turn to kind of, kind of illustrate how um, that might tell us about chemical change. Now just remember that um, when we're thinking about chemical change, we're not typically thinking that only one of these things is happening. There will usually be more than one thing that we can identify. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to kind of to, to be observing carefully with all your senses when we're, you suspect that chemical change is going on. Okay, so when we're talking about chemical change, remember we're talking about the formation of new substances or a new substance by rearranging atoms. So we're taking the atoms that are, that are connected together in, in our starting materials, our reactants, and we're pulling them apart and reconnecting them into a new combination to make products. So if you look at the, the example and the, the image that we've got here, we've got atoms of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen connected together in one particular way, and then during this process that we've broken them apart and connected them in a new way to make carbon dioxide and water. So all the atoms are accounted for, all the reds, all the blacks and whites are present. It's a bit hard to see um, some of the ones in this one over on the left because of them, they're making it, you know, try to look 3D for you. Um, but that those atoms during this process, um, while they are still there, they're in a new arrangement as that process has happened. Okay, so we're going to start off with we'll look at a colour change. So seeing an example of here that you know in this case we've gone from colorless to kind of this really dark kind of blue black sort of color you know or it could be um you know it could be changing from red to green or or it could be something more subtle that occurs as a chemical reaction is happening now do be careful that color change on its own is not very um unique to chemical change that um physical changes um that can involve um, what seems to be a colour change as well. Okay, so you have to be careful there um, to not um, to not base um, too much place too much weight on that. Okay, um, and so then we also have the bubbles of gas that would form. Okay, so it's like the classic situation of uh, vinegar and bicarb when you mix them together and you get bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. Okay, scientifically we would use the term effervescence to describe the production of, of gas in a, in a chemical reaction. Okay, um, so you can see in the image that's here. The next one that can happen is what we call forming of a precipitate. So precipitate is the scientific word for um, what happens when some, when we mix things together and we get a cloudy appearance or things go cloudy so they're not transparent and easy to see anymore they may be kind of translucent or almost opaque depending on exactly how cloudy it, it is the reason that it goes cloudy is that we have formed and when these two things are mixed or, or when things are reacting this way we formed an insoluble solid that is a sol a substance that does not dissolve in the in the water or in the solution that's there. So what it does is it becomes a solid instead of being dissolved, in, um, and so we see that solid. So you can see four kind of examples in this this kind of um, compilation here of different precipitates. So that you know we have a, a really kind of vivid yellow one, and then we've got three other kind of white ones, but that also do have kind of difference in their appearance. Okay, so um, we call that insoluble solid a precipitate. The next one that we can notice that's a, that's a very um, common thing to observe with chemical reactions is um, the, a, an effect on the temperature of their surroundings. Okay, so lots of chemical reactions um, will increase the temperature of their surroundings, will make things hotter. You can feel the test tube is hot to the touch. Um, and so we call um, chemical reactions that do this, that give off 
um, heat or give out this thermal energy. We call them exothermic. Exo being from the, the same root of the word exit, so out of, so and thermic from like thermal or heat. Okay, so that heat is out of the reaction and it increases the temperature of everything around it. Likewise, then, there are some reactions um, which are perhaps less um, familiar to you that where the temperature actually goes down. Okay, so the example that we're seeing in this, this one here is that we're mixing um, two kind of chemicals together as they're solids, and as they react together, it kind of forms this sort of slurry or this, this kind of slushy snow kind of like um, appearance, and it drops to the temperature dramatically. Um, we would also um, notice that if you have... Um, bicarb and citric acid like you might have in many kind of fizzy kind of medications or things like that that when they actually start to react together that they get much colder as well and so reactions where the temperature decreases or where um yeah we call them endothermic which is the opposite so endo means into thermic for thermal or heat so heat goes into the reaction so it absorbs heat or absorbs thermal energy from the surroundings um, and so we say it's endothermic Okay, and exactly how much energy gets given off or gets absorbed from the surroundings will vary. Um, you know, so if you light up a container of hydrogen gas and it explodes, then there's a lot of thermal energy that get, gets given off, which is different to, say, putting a bit of magnesium in a bit of acid in a test tube where it might get a little bit warm. Um, okay, so, so there's, you know, um, while we might categorize it as one type or the other, that it, it's a very much a, a spectrum of, of how it behaves. Okay, but aside from thermal energy or, or the, this idea of, of temperature change, we also get other types of energy that can be released. Um, and so we might be thinking about light, like you would have in, in glow sticks or in candles, um, or th this is a, a photo of burning magnesium, which you might have done in the lab, okay, where an intense white light is given off. Um, and so, you know, so in, in situations like the, the candle and the glow stick, um, that the, the production of light is actually the point or, you know, part of the reason that we would do this, you know, that in a glow stick that we actually want that light um, to be produced because of that chemical reaction. You know, part of the purpose of a candle is to give light and also to give a certain amount of warmth. Um, yeah, whereas in the mag case of magnesium, it's, it's more just a nature of its reaction. Um, Although old-fashioned um, photographers used to use magnesium in their flash bulbs, so that they would would you know hold them up, you know hold up a kind of a stick that would have some, um, some magnesium in the, the top, and then they would light a charge, and it would it would flash bright white, and so that would be like early flash photography, I'm going back a long way now. Um, but also um, sound energy, you know, kind of fizzing sounds or popping sounds or kind of more, if something more explosive like a boom, okay, that's also a release of energy from chemical change. Um, and then especially like when we're thinking about things like explosions here, you know, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of light, there's sound, but we also get energy that's being involved in uh, making gases expand, getting them to push away. That's the whole purpose of high explosives is this pressure or shock wave um, from the expanding gases. That's what makes them so destructive and which can be useful or it can be devastating in terms of weapons as well. But they're all involving um, different types of energy release. Okay, so um, the, last, the last two that we have involve the appearance of a, a new substance, or I say it would appearance in inverted commas, because um, we notice something that wasn't there before. It feels like a line from Beauty and the Beast. Um, but this idea that, um, that, that because of this chemical change, that something has become visible that, that may not have been visible before. So looking at um, the image on the left, that we've got a, a sample of copper wire that's been placed into a solution of silver nitrate. And then after some time, we've actually got crystals of silver metal that have appeared on the surface, you know, attached to that copper wire. And then if you also notice, eagle-eyed viewers, that the solution itself has become blue. And what's actually happened is that some of the copper metal has dissolved and the silver, some of the dissolved silver metal has um, precipitated or kind of um, collected where that wire was. And so the, 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 when copper 
is dissolved in water that it gives it a blue color and so we've gone from fairly colorless to kind of blue as this change has happened they've swapped places so it's not that the silver just kind of magically appeared but it wasn't visible in the same way before and likewise rust seems to appear on the surface of, of something that's uh, made of iron metal or steel which is a, an alloy of iron um, and so where the rust has actually transformed the iron in the metal into um, iron oxide or well, this, this process of corrosion into this iron oxide, which is what rust is. Um, it's the same chemical that gives the, the rocks on Mars their characteristic red colour, or the red dirt that's very unique to Australia, um, you know, has high levels of iron in it, which give it that, that kind of colour. And the last one that we want to be familiar with is this idea of an existing substance disappearing. Okay, same sort of deal as before, that it's not that the, the copper has kind of vanished into thin air. In this case, we've got a a, a US old-fashioned copper penny um, dissolving in nitric acid. So the copper, so we get a, a reaction, we get a production of this, this nitrogen dioxide kind of toxic brown gas up, up here in the test tube, and then we end up with this blue coppery solution down the bottom of copper nitrate. And so, um, yeah, so the copper is still around, it's just changed its appearance, um, it seems to have disappeared. Um, and so that's something that can be a useful thing to spot. For chemical change, but um, just you know, when we've been thinking about this list of, of different signs of a chemical reaction, remember that if you take one in isolation, that doesn't that's not very conclusive. But when you think about multiple signs altogether, like how many things does it tick off, um, that can give you a much stronger conclusion that there is chemical change going on. Okay, and so you need to, to just think carefully about all the things that you're observing and what that might tell you. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.